is this and keep this in mind we're gonna have a quiz next monday it's gonna be based on wherever we end with this chapter maybe we get done with the whole chapter who knows but it's gonna be on chapter 11 alone all right so this will be quiz three i want to give you as many quizzes as possible and you know why right all i need is six i think there's six best quizzes so that's a cool deal so the more quizzes we have the more you get a drop try to do your best on every quiz of course but i'm trying to have eight or nine that lets you drop, I mean, three quizzes. Think about that. That's pretty cool, right? That's why I don't give makeup quizzes. So I have a question about that, but I thought I'd discuss that earlier. <clears throat> all right, guys. Now, here's what I'm going to do today, all right? I'm going to introduce and probably even finish chapter 11. Now, here's how we're going to study these diseases. We're going to study them systematically. So the first, the next four chapters is all bacterial diseases. And the next three chapters, that is all viral diseases. And then we have one chapter on fungi and then a one chapter on parasites, all right? So it's best to study these by systems, by groupings. So the first thing we're gonna look at today is airborne bacterial diseases. Think about this airborne, that tells you a whole lot. You usually require these bacteria that cause disease in humans to respiratory droplets. I think about for the COVID-19 virus, basically that's how you uh, get that virus is through uh, respiratory droplets, same here, all right? Okay, so I have my objectives here for you. Come on. All right, but we're going to go through each of these. It seems like a whole lot, and you're right, it is. But this is just done. Actually, the slides, I try to make the slides as concise as possible so you don't have to read your book in detail. Ah, you should read your book, of course, but when I write my exam, it's going to be based totally on the slides that you see, all right? The earlier you start studying this, the better it is. So let me just give a little introduction to diseases in general. And I want to tell you how important infectious diseases really are. Now, you guys got a taste of that with COVID-19. Maybe you have family members who are infected, and hopefully they're doing well. But many people, of course, have died, 175,000 people in a very short period of time, all right? So we always would have to deal with infectious agents. That's not going to change. So let's just go back to a little history back here. If you go back to the voyages, Captain Cook's voyages, this is about two, uh, almost 300 years ago. Uh, they took a voyage to the, just as an example, the Hawaiian Islands. Now, it was estimated that the population of Hawaii, all those islands there, was about 300,000 people back in 1778. Now, after this voyage, about 100 years after, Europeans actually ended up in Hawaii. Check out what that number declined to. Basically, only about 10% of the population was left. So, for all the Hawaiian Islands, it came down 100 years later to about 37,000 people. Now, it wasn't because wars were fought. That didn't happen at all. It was primarily because of disease. So here's the thing. If you, like, like what happened with COVID-19, if you haven't seen that disease before in a population and you introduce this pathogen, many people become infected. In this case, many people die, all right? So things like influenza. They never saw this in the Hawaiian Islands. Things like syphilis and a tuberculosis. All that stuff was brought from the old world to, uh, to, to the islands back here. So that tells you a whole lot. Infectious disease, given the right chance, they spread like crazy. Uh, if you look at the black plague caused by Yersinia pestis, you look through history, of course, they didn't know what the organism was, but they described the disease pretty well. Now just take a look at just the, the mid-centuries, about 1300 or so, 40 million people were killed in a few years, all right? That was about a third of Europe's population. Why? It's because of infectious diseases. Other diseases that wiped out millions of people, TB still does, by the way. Every year, it's the number one killer on the planet today. Tuberculosis, two million people die every year because of TB. And diphtheria was a horrible thing before we had a vaccine for it. So again, diseases you already have in your mind, man. Wow, you know, we hear about diseases, but we, we really don't know what it is. That's what we're going to be studying, all right? We can't get rid of many of these diseases. They're going to be with us for a long time. Now, if we're to live in the United States about 120, 30, 40 years ago, the la average lifespan, check this out, was about 46 to 48 years old. So people just were the typical individual, average lifespan, less than 50 years. That's incredible. I'll be dead already. I hate to even think about that, all right? But why? Primarily, it wasn't because of wars and stuff. The country was stable back then. But here's the thing, it's because of infectious diseases, all right? In fact, back then, if you look at the stats, until the mid-1800s, uh, basically, kids, uh, one and two kids, uh, kids died uh, before age five, all right? So again, that's really significant. 
it goes back to many of these diseases. Now, some other things to consider. If you look at the average lifespan, as I just told you for the United States back 120, 30 years ago, it was less than 50 years old. Now we have that uh, increased tremendously. It's like about 80 years, about 80, 81 or so. It varies, of course, with ethnic groups. African-Americans, 75. For Asian-Americans, 86. Latinos is 83. Native Americans is like 80. And for whites in general, it's about 80. The average in general, and this, this can vary by states too, by the way, it's around 78 to about 81 years. If you live in Monaco, it's about 90 years. So that's a pretty cool place to live. I don't know why. Uh, less stress, I guess. I was born in Trinidad. This is in the West Indies. It's 73 years old. Uh, United States against about 80. And Chad, check out Chad. This is a country in Africa. 49 years old. It's a basic lifespan for people who live in Chad. The average is just 49 years. So this is like the United States about 150 years ago. So that's incredible. Why? Primarily because of disease. Now the last stat I want to show you back here. All right, so this is no. So basically right now we we're in about 2020 right here. All right. So this is the difference between males and females. And the prediction also extends to 2050. Probably be so for forever, really. Females tend to live about uh, four to eight years lo uh, longer than males. So that hasn't changed. If you take a look at the stats, uh, right, it hasn't changed for heck, over 120 years. All right. Now, other things to keep in mind. Yeah, we're going to be talking about specific organisms. Let me just say, if you work in a hospital, these are the typical things that you see. And we already saw them in the lab. So I'm just going to mention here, gram-positive toxins, staph, strep, enterococcus, gram-negative toxide, enterococcus, gram-positive rods, Carina bacterium, lactobacillus, clostridium. These are really dangerous ones. Clostridium and, and uh, listeria. And of course, everything else is gram-negative rods. So again, typically these are the things that you would see. Of course, what I want to focus on are diseases that, uh, that you find in the upper respiratory tract today, all right? So here's a nice little figure for you. It kind of lists those diseases. It tells you what the normal bacteria and microorganisms are. I'm going to focus on the ones that are packed, right? Okay, so these are airborne bacterial diseases. These diseases are spread primarily to this respiratory droplets. So he has a nice little picture taken against a, back, a black background. If you notice, uh, we have this person sneezes, tons of particles, and you can even tell different sizes. So these are large ones, they fall to the ground, not much is going to happen. The intermediate one or the medium-sized ones, they can get trapped in the air passages, and then they can be cleared, so not much happens there. So the largest droplets don't cause us much trouble. But you can see this haze in the background, those are microscopic particles. Imagine if they contain pathogens, you can breathe them in and they can get to the uh, uh, upper respiratory tract and then lower respiratory tract to cause pneumonia, all right? So again, the point is this, for these diseases here, the major route is to respiratory droplets. All right, now again, we're gonna get to the pathogens in a bit, but I wanna talk about defenses that you already have. So this is, these are defenses that are built in to help protect you from an infection, all right? So this is the respiratory passage. If you were to take a look at a section, a tissue section, this is what you would see, all right? You see these cells, they're called pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. You probably remember that from A and P. They have these little structures on them. Those are cilia. And these cilia are always moving upwards, all right? Now check this out. There's some other uh, cells back here. These are called goblet cells. If you remember, goblet cells produce mucus. So basically, the respiratory passages, like the intestinal or the digestive system, is lined with mucus. Now check this out. When you breathe in, imagine you're breathing in bacteria or viruses or pollen grains or dust particles. Those things can get trapped in mucus. And that's pretty cool because it's not going to go down further into the lungs. But check out this, this other thing here. Yeah, the mucus traps these particles. But these cilia, they're always moving upwards. So look at me for a second. The cilia are moving upwards. It's going to propel the mucus to my oral cavity. And then I'm going to swallow that. Imagine if I have pathogens. That's going to end up in my stomach. And then the acids in the stomach would actually kill those pathogens. All right? Okay. So we have a pretty cool defense mechanism. But of course, people still get infected. Now, some terms I'd like you to know. They are clinical terms, and you'll be using them in your practice. Rhinitis. Rhin. Rhin refers to the nose, nasal passages. Remember this itis. Every time you see this word itis, you see that uh, you see this as the last part of many words. 
that means inflammation. All right, so itis, rhinitis, this is inflammation of the nasal passages. Uh, allergies can cause this, but pathogens, viruses in particular can cause this. Sinusitis, so we know what that means. Yes, the sinuses, all right? So the sinuses can be inflamed. Both of these are primarily caused by viruses, all right? Of course, when it comes to air infections, more common in kids, we have something called otitis externa. Ono refers to the air. Otitis is inflammation of the air, but the outer air here. And then primarily in kids, we see this condition. You've probably heard this term before. Otitis media. Media means middle. This is the middle air, all right? Okay, so this is the middle air infection. So we're looking at this area here. Okay, so having said this, <clears throat> these are the organisms we're going to look at with upper respiratory tract disease. Look at me for a bit. Uh, we have the upper respiratory tract. This is from your voice box. This is the larynx. Upper, res upper respiratory tract is from the nose all the way down to the larynx of the voice box. So we have many different diseases we're going to be talking about, uh, different pathogens. Uh, the worst condition would be lower respiratory tract infection. This is from the voice box to deep lung. So we actually have infection and inflammation of the lung itself, all right? <clears throat> I list these organisms here for you. This is the causative agent. These are the bacteria that cause disease. These are the diseases we'll be looking at for upper respiratory tract disease. Yes, you know, I said, nice. These tables are really, really cool. It puts things in perspective for you. Yes, I want you to look at all the slides. But before you look at the slides, I want you to look at this table. What are we talking about here? Well, these are the diseases, the organisms that cause them, signs and symptoms. If you, if you see a patient with obvious sign and symptom, you can actually identify that disease. Transmission, they're all going to be respiratory droplets. All right. Prevention, just uh, good hygiene practices. Sometimes there's a vaccine like DPT, the period tetanus pertussis. So I'll come back to that again. What I'm not so interested in is that you memorize this, all right? So antibiotics, unless I tell you otherwise, what I care more about is to know if there's a vaccine for a pathogen, but unless I tell you otherwise, don't waste your time memorizing. Here's an antibiotic, we can use it against that pathogen, all right? I'm not so interested in that. All right, so let's get to it. The first group of organisms I'm gonna be talking about is Streptococcus flu. And let me just say, uh, we can actually classify these organisms using different type of techniques. So for example, we can grow the organism on agar plates, except this agar plate contains blood. So this is called blood agar plate, and you don't need to know that yet, all right? But this is DAP. So you make this plate and you put 5% sheep blood in it. That's why it appears red. And then you grow streptococcus on them, and then you see these different patterns. Here's all I want you to know. When it comes to blood agar plates, we can classify streptococcus into three different groups. Beta hemolysis, that's treating a beta sign, so we actually culture the organ, it doesn't grow that way, made it grow that way, all right? That's beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and then gamma. So let me just say a little about them. Bacteria that can do this, they produce a lot of powerful toxins. These toxins destroy blood cells. So that's beta hemolysis. Uh, when we look at alpha hemolysis, they're producing some toxins, but not a whole lot. And then we have gamma, that means no toxins are being produced, all right? So again, all I'm saying is, is that we can classify an organism just based on what they look like on blood agar plate, right? And again, uh, we have uh, basically uh, three different classifications, alpha, beta, and gamma. It doesn't tell you what the names are. Now, another way to classify these organisms is to look at the carbohydrates. These are sugars that you find on the surface of the cell. So different species have different sugars, and we can look at what those differences are and actually name them, all right? So we have hemolytic patterns, and then we have the differences in carbohydrates. And again, not much to remember here, all right? Except that we can now put specific names to them. All right, group A streptococcus, group B streptococcus, group G, C, uh, group F. Those are examples. The two most important groups are right here. All purposes today is group A. So we're gonna focus on a group A streptococcus, that organism is called streptococcus pyogenes. Okay, so having said that, I want to go straight to the first organism. So here's where you have to start studying things, all right? So again, we're going to name an organism, tell you about a little about the organism, and tell you about the diseases they cause. All right, so let's go for it. The top organism on the list here is Streptococcus pyogenes. 
So we saw streptococcus already in the gram stain, right? You guys actually, when you did the gram stain, we talked about this organism. 